Never before in the history of this challenge has anybody sent me a submission with full choir. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lovely, lovely score, FJ. And um, th my only complaint, <laughs> my only big overall complaint is I just really wish there were some way of, the <clears throat> of making the staff sizes bigger. You know, if it just, you know, even just like a, just a, just a couple of little points bigger, it, it would be so much easier to read. I mean, I've got it up here on full screen and I'm recommending everybody out there <clears throat> with this evaluation 
and the uh, last evaluation from uh, Yon Martin Vigne uh, to watch those to watch these on <clears throat> a um, like a, a smart television, right? Something like where you can get the YouTube app and you can play it. Because, wow, it's just, you know, I'm looking at this on a, actually a fairly large screen with really, really good resolution. And, um, yeah, it's playing hell with my eyes. <clears throat> so we are going to evaluate things backwards. Um, I, I don't know if you've been following the recent uh, evaluations, uh, FJ, like these these last three dozen or so, four dozen or so full-length evaluations. But we, we, we've we been starting at the end and then working our way backwards. So I'll evaluate E for you now, and then we'll do D, and then we'll go back to the beginning of the score and <clears throat> start from A through C. Okay. So... Um, I, I have a slight aesthetic problem with the whole tenuto staccato staccato tenuto staccato staccato idea of the articulation pattern here. I just feel it's kind of turning things into too much of a waltz. You know, da 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 da. da. Do you see what I mean? And I, I mean, I, and I think it's like unnecessary to to push push on the emphasis of every strong beat in the compound time. Um, I mean, you might be better off with accents rather than staccatos or, or just marking it marcato at the beginning, like fortissimo marcato, and then just let the player work out how much of that they can do without, you know, losing their mind or blowing out their embouchure or something. So we'll be discussing <clears throat> the orchestration of this in a little bit more detail. The main concern here is how... Um, how workable is the fade out? How much does it lead to the next section? And so on. All right, so you've actually decided to go with uh, a little bit of extra clarinet extending forwards. And same with uh, cellos here. Uh, about um, two octaves apart. And then... <clears throat> Right in here, you have your uh, your ooze from everybody but the sopranos. You know, it like looking at the <laughs> looking at the scoring. You know, it makes me wonder. You know, if, if you're going to arrange this for choir, <clears throat> whether Barvinsky was quoting any um, folk tune. Uh, you know, sort of transforming uh, um, a, a known folk song and whether or not that would be good to add in here as lyrics. So you would have to be working <clears throat> with the Ukrainian language and setting it and, um, yeah. So that can be a challenge. I once um, wrote some lyrics, had them translated into Bulgarian and then, and then set them to music to a to for a Bulgarian choir. It was just an experiment. It wasn't um uh it wasn't like a, a an attempt to to really um do anything all that important, but I recorded it with one singer doing all of the tracks and she was great. She was fantastic. Um but you know nothing ever came of it, but I found that like after <laughs> after I'd done what I felt to just be like a throwaway project to just kind of improve myself, I just really kind of liked those songs and I wanted them to um, to have more of a life than just a recording project. So here, um, you've chosen to go portato with your bassoons, right? But then just tenuto with your clarinet here. So... Um, and 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 your uh, bases. So I think you should you should find um, a strategy of articulation and stick to it with everybody. Keeping in mind that if you do just decide to import the articulation approach from the score, um, you know the those same uh, tenutos which are in the piano part. They actually mean something completely different in the different instruments, right? 
I mean, to an extent, yes, that in all of the instruments they mean to play with a full, like a like an, a nice full tone, right? Um, with with of course, a lot of that's really subjective on piano because, you know, a piano is just a matter of nuancing the different levels of attack, uh, the, the different levels, and then un, un, lengthening and shortening notes, right? So you don't have the power of nuance over each note that you do in uh, strings, winds, and brass. Okay, like you can't really do note shaping in a way. You can phrase, you can shape phrases, um, and you can you can shape isolated notes on a piano, but like you can't really get the same kind of nuance. All right, so what does all that have to do with tenuto marks? Well, the thing about it is, um, on string instruments, a tenuto uh, mark means a full length bow, right? So it's almost like the word zoom. So like the player's going zoom, 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 right? On this, and then with a with a wind instrument, it's like doot. Do, 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 you know, like it is like, it's really like, it doesn't have that, you know, it doesn't have that sort of lovely, and the same thing with the, with the strings, it doesn't, it doesn't have that same, you know, nice shape to every note when you stick a tenuto on it. Now here, if you go portato, it's like pulse, it becomes a pulsing thing. And you know, I think in a, I had a I had a passage of portato, and I and you know there's different degrees of portato. Sometimes it can be a real like a real dragging kind of a stroke um, for the strings. But I wrote floating under it, and the and the string section completely got it. I didn't have to say a thing in rehearsal. They absolutely sounded beautiful and perfect. So it isn't like it isn't just so simple to just say hey portato right. Um, so really like. Decide what it is, and 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 maybe maybe just slurring, right? Da da, right? Okay. Well, um, all that, all the articulation aside, which is hard to put aside. Let's check out how you've scored this: double bass, uh, lower divisi double bass on the bottom, and then the upper one is doubling the bassoon. And then on top of that, you've got the clarinet and the octave. So it's a you know it's a nice rich triple octave that you've scored there. And then picking up from that, uh, we have uh, first clarinet coming in, first bassoon, and cellos. Yeah, and I'm just not so convinced here by you know zoom zoom zoom. I think it's you know it's just like you know. Mm -hmm -hmm. It just really feels a little forced, a little over the top. And then here, like the beautiful slur, da, 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 da. I just think that's so lovely in the violas here. And yeah, and uh, clarinet and bass clarinet. I don't even think you need this. Like like here you'd like throw in uh, an extra pitch here. Like is this supposed to be tied maybe? These two C's in the second clarinet supposed to be tied? I don't think you need any extra emphasis on here. You've already got... Uh, <clears throat> the second bassoon holding that same sounding pitch. Yeah, you don't need the second clarinet there. Yeah. And then here you go to tremolo. Right. Now, uh, you're trading off the, uh, the melodic voice, <laughs> right, to your, um, to your choir. Okay, but uh, I want you to think about one thing, and and like you know we can see some of the problem on the next page, but okay, we'll we'll talk about it in a second. Let me. I just want to cover something about your uh, vibraphone. Um, try to connect uh, groups, beam groups, um, tremolo groups with the slur, right? Rather than just making them completely dry. It's just a, it's just a little bit, you know, just absolutely shows that these, you know, at least with a vibraphone, I, I, I mean, you're missing a pedal marking here. I feel like, do you, I mean, like literally, what you've scored here is, you know, it's not with a, you know, with the, um, with the, um, connotation of 
of being sustained, right? And being kind of nice and gooey and pedaled. So I'd say put in the pedal mark, put in a slur mark, maybe over the whole bar or over each group. Okay. Then you get the effect that you want. All right. So we have these, <clears throat> like when, when this melody goes up to hold the bees, the bees are actually becoming, they're continuing on with the melody, but you're choosing to go to a different voice here, right? So like, so the the altos are really singing the Bs that become the melody in the next page, that the, everything changes, as we'll see. So that's that's totally fine. Um, okay, so, so look, the main concern here, FJ, is that the, um, is that the accompaniment from above does not become the melody in the mind of the listener. So you might think, well, how is that possible? I mean, I've, I've got the melody nicely scored here, violas and, you know, tenors and basses, and yeah, that should be fine, right? Well, maybe. You've got these marked piano, and you've got these marked piano, and the ear will pick out the upper voice as being the more important one, just because of the way we're wired as human beings and as listeners from, as concert music listeners. So <clears throat> there is a real risk here with the way that you have your dynamics set up that the, um, that the melody will um, be a little obscured by the accompaniment part. So I would, you know, I would mark the accompanying harmony as being a little under, like so, pianissimo, really. And then just yeah, a simple piano for all of these. Now, do you, I mean, do you really want tenuto on your, like you want, you really want heavy, like, you know, ah, oh, ah, right? I mean, that's like, that's that would be a tenuto, right? As opposed to, Ah, oh, ah, as it would just be normally marked without the force, like, like, like when you put the tenuto mark in, you're just really saying, I want an element of force and heaviness in this, and I want it to be a block of, like, a block of cheese, right? Uh, what if it were a, a, a slur and a slur? Ah, oh, ah. See what I mean? So much smoother and more beautiful than like just going zoom, 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 ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. You know, just really, there's a just take away the blockiness that is in the piano part. I mean, the piano part, because it is a piano and because it has the sustain and the attack that it does, it's great with the, that tenuto marking. But but articulation markings do not necessarily import all that well from piano to winds and strings. And brass. Okay, and, and you know, and like, like here you've got, you're going. Diddly diddly. So I think you're like thinking, like we're going to just tie ahead. So you don't need to do this. These ties here, just have one slur over the top. In fact, I would just say slur the entire bar over to here. Okay, it'll work out. All right, it's like you know, you're saying, oh, well, I'm trying to tell the player that they don't need to, they don't need to actually play the chord at the end. I think that that will just come through. The yeah, I mean, I mean, you can do it if you like, but it just looks hella messy. To uh, quote my brother, who went to Berkeley High School, the place in which the word "hella" was invented. All right, um, yeah, and yeah, just. Yeah, maybe turn the French horns into slurs and stuff. I really like the way that you're keeping them in the background. I think that's absolutely beautiful. Keep them in the background. Keep your um, <clears throat> your female vocalists in the background. Keep your tremolo strings above in the background. All right, and then I think that all of this will sound beautiful. There's no need to... I don't think there's any need to go down to triple P here. Just, just pianissimo and then a little bit of diminuendo at the end of each one. Coming back to pianissimo and a little diminuendo. All right, and then certainly, if you want, um, 
if you want the harp to come through here over the singers and everything else, all the other texture, I would definitely like see here is where you could have Tenuto in the in the harp, right? They would work out beautifully. So I would actually have this written out as octaves in both harps. Okay, pling, pling, pling. And you know, what's the melody here? It isn't A. It's back to F sharp, right? Da 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 da. And here the melody goes to da 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 da. So really go to the F sharp because the F sharp is setting up this F sharp. Da 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 da. Right. So da 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 da. Yeah. So, so yeah. So just think that there is a, there is a, argh, my, one of my screens keeps dying. There is an implied leap right here. All right. Da, 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 bum, bum. And I, I love the use of two harps. Okay. Um, like I, I didn't say that that was something I would allow in the evaluations, uh, in the challenge, but it's fine that you did it here. Like you, you really are justifying it, and it works really, really well with the the choral approach here. Okay, and then you know here we get down to some some nitty gritty kind of um, uh, reeds playing the uh, playing the yeah da 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 part. That's really nice in here. So, like, no problems here. Okay, clarinet solo. So, yeah, I mean, so, so you get this mixed sound here. You want the clarinet in the foreground, and you want the, uh, the trumpet in the background. Okay, so that's all good. And then you want... Uh, your horn an octave below that is a really it's a very very cool sound yeah yeah so like this is the kind of thing that the conductor there's like nothing you can say the conductor just has to keep an eye on it and make sure that the trumpet player doesn't play out too much right and then here that this beautiful fade away as your as your um harps come in uh, just one little note here i don't think you need to do this uh, all these ties. I think you just need a nice big slur over the top. Uh, and like you don't even need the chords. You just need to end on this. Right? And and that it'll just happen. Right? There, the, there is nothing that the harpist can do to make this tie any more than it already will. And if you have the big um, arpeggio all the way up to this high uh, note up here, then it'll just continue, like everything will continue to vibrate and hold. So you, you kind of don't need the ties. I mean, it's, you know, it's just like visual, more, more visual stuff. Like the, the less that you put that in, the better. It's not like the harpist is going to go and damp out everything that's underneath that, that held note, right? You don't have to worry about that. Just, just have a nice big slur over the top that ends, you know, that goes all the way to the end. That's what that means. That's what all this means right in here. This is this is something that I would <clears throat> only score if I had no pedal in a piano part, right? So if I just like you know, you know, just holding down all four of those notes with my stretched fingers, and then like, but no pedal, right? So that's when I would need the ties. But the harp has just got its built-in sustain, so you don't need that. All right, so this is all just nicely done. I just really like this and the way that it sets up. The very last little solo here in the flute, Bum. or soli. I say with ah two soli here, right? And the same thing here. I would say number one solo, and then I would just not write solo in these other parts. They're supporting this solo. So ah two soli or ah due if you prefer. Da da da. So are sure, are you sure you want to go da. Like you have these other articulated notes. Wouldn't it be good to give that flute player uh, the articulated E? And isn't this a, supposed to be a D, not an E? Da, E, E, da. Oh, yeah, see, like here you've written the D in the other parts. 
Yeah, so this is supposed to be a D. So I guess that's just a that's just a oversight. Yeah, and and that's doubling the uh, the choir here. That, that'll turn out really beautifully. Yep. Yeah, that all works. This just kind of working its way down here, and then <clears throat> having um, the ends right in here. Yeah, and uh, just a little bit of vibraphone here. Yeah, it, it'll be played non-arpeggiando, but I'm almost tempted to write non-arp here, just to absolutely be sure that it's going to go ching or have like a have like a bracket on it. Just to really, 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 really make sure that it isn't rolled, right? So yeah, so yeah, FJ, I really love this ending, and I think it's uh, there. There are one or two little things I didn't get time to cover, but I'm sure people will mention in the comments below. But um, yeah, just wonderful use of the choir and the oohs and ahs. And I just really feel it all the more with this. You know, what if this were, what if there were some lyrics, some some uh, song, some poem that would really, really work well with this and give a meaning to the entire prelude that we haven't seen yet? That would be fantastic. Um, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll ask... Uh, some of our Ukrainian composer and performer friends uh, when I link this on Facebook um, if they know of any text that might go to go with this prelude that would work or if there is any folk song that Barvinsky is referencing because that would be amazing and you know could be further impetus for you to get this score together and uh, show it around to some conductors who might want to slot in some Ukrainian music in their programs. I mean, wouldn't it be great, folks, if like <laughs> this challenge led to a bunch of premieres all over the world of different people, you know, working their working their Barvinsky challenge orchestrations into different programs here and there? That would just would be wonderful. Now let's jump back to the beginning of the D section. And I think it's really cool the way that you are like often just kind of using half your strength here in the winds from time to time, like in a, especially in a soft passage and where you need some of the other instruments to play different functions, right? So you've got, <clears throat> you've got uh, half your winds here or half your upper winds Oh, flutes and oboes playing the melody, and you've got the other half playing the cascading octaves. It's such a such a lovely idea. Um, and uh, <laughs> what I will say about this is that you barely, you just barely keep the cascading octaves from getting squelched by the rest of the orchestra. Now, when certain things sort of push into the sound picture a little bit, and a little bit more, then the cascading octaves become less and less difficult excuse me, less and less easy to hear, especially like, you know, here with the mezzo forte horns and so on. Um, but, uh, you you know, you're compensating here with the cascading octaves here in the strings, uh, getting louder and so on. Okay, so, I mean, there's a lot to work over. Like, if this score were um, handed to me by you and you said, look, Thomas, I need the, to get everything in this score really polished because we've got a, you know, we've got a recording session in two weeks and so on, um, or a month or, you know, it just really needs to be together. So like there would be a lot of discussions that we would have around, around certain issues. You know, one of them is that like, you've got a vibraphone player and you've got two harpists here and you're using both of your harpists to play identical pitched glissandos. Okay, so, all right, so right here you could be using a single harp to play the glissandos. And then you could be using the other harpist to double uh, some of these pitches along with the vibraphone, right? And just giving them more, uh, more of a kind of a lucid glowing quality rather than just really, you know... Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to overdo it on the, on the, um, on telling people how important it is to make sure this is heard. 
And like I said, you've almost got it completely nailed in terms of not letting those parts be submerged too much in the texture. Almost. So if you want to just get it down to absolute perfection, leave the octave, uh, leave your uh, your octave glissandos to one of the harpists and then have the other harpist uh, play unison on some and maybe even bring in the vibrato the vibrato the uh vibraphone player uh on you know helping out maybe trading off with the harp or playing alongside the harp or some other kind of thing um yeah now right in here after the fourth bar you drop down an octave and then you keep your cascading um, octaves down that same octave in in strings and winds and then you jump back up again but look uh, FJ you do absolutely do not need to do that that is something that was in the score okay uh, because Barvinsky needed his hand centered right there because of the uh, prominence, like the, the the increased activity in the in the um, the left hand uh, middle voice part, right? So he's bringing the octaves down so that his eyes aren't you know aren't all over the place, right? So that's the reason for that. So you do not need uh, to drop an octave here. Drop an octave and give me twenty. You do not need to drop an octave here. But I mean the fact that you do gives you room to throw in this extra bit of melodic coloring from above. So, I mean, I'm not saying it's all bad or that you should never have it or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, just one observation about that right in here is that, like, we just have a teeny bit of it and then the octaves sort of take away the rest of the, the flute part right in there. So it's kind of hard for that same thing to be maintained. Maybe this is a place for Divisi... Um, uh, Divisi in the in the strings and keeping one of these flute parts high. Yeah. Anyhow, but I mean, it's it's such a cool. I mean, it's such cool scoring. And then you know this with this stuff in here. Once again, I just really wish that we had some kind of, you know, some kind of Ukrainian text that you could set here. I think it just would make it a really big hit. You know, like this could be one of the. Let, let's say that like. A dozen or two dozen, <laughs> I would hope all 152. But let's let's say that one or two dozen of these uh, these scores becomes, you know, just makes their way and starts getting performed a lot. I would really hope that this would be one of them, and that you would add lyrics. And I think that the lyrics would would make perfect sense, and you could just change things from oohs and ahs into you know Slava Ukraini or whatever you know what whatever would work in there. Anyway, to, to get back to the orchestration, um, pretty much no problems in here. Muted trumpets, I think that will work fine, and, and the horns right in here work great, and little touches of trombone coming in here. Keeping it pianissimo to triple P and so on and so forth, here you're kind of building in strength a little bit more each time. Pianissimo, piano, mezzo piano, at which point you're putting on more and more weight with your strings. So it's just like really you're thinking of a lot of things in here. Um, yeah, but all the same, pushing into this will blur at, you know, the, the, cl the clarity that you've got here in your, um, in your cascading octaves. But, I mean, this is one of the best cascading octave passages, and I am kind of slightly heartbroken <laughs> at the fact that you have, um, such a moderate grade level, um, uh, mock-up or uh, sound set for this, right? I just feel like something a little bit more sophisticated would show everybody just how beautifully balanced a lot of this stuff is. Hmm, it's strange my cat grunted in, I, I hope, in uh, approval of what I just said. Okay, um, so now moving on to the sort of more Ravel type part where it's got those you know, beautiful... Um, those big beautiful chords um yeah and you're pushing your trumpets pretty high here but i mean that not nothing 
nothing too insane. You know, same thing. You know, first first horn is getting getting up there to G sharp and so on. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, mezzo forte on a high B. So I, I don't understand why you're going soft here. You know, da da da. Isn't this the place to diminuendo? And then you want to go um, da, da 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 da. What if you just get soft here and go back to forte, right? You might be thinking, well, I'm, just, I'm trying to give the strings a break in here. Well, forget about them. Um, if you want this to balance, they're eventually going to have to get to the fortissimo that they are playing here, anyways, right? So. Mm. Yeah, but I'm just, you know, you have all of these high notes uh, in your in your brass. So you're just going to have a very, very bright, big, uh, piercing color up there. Whatever you do. <laughs> right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, hey, here, what if you just cut out the tuba here and let the bass trombone do this, right? Da, 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 da. And then same thing here. So um, just have your tuba player go da, and then have your trombonist come in here and go da, and then it can throw it, you can jump down to the F sharp, which the tuba player is also playing, right? Yeah, so... I mean, you know, maybe this triple octave here in the tuba is not the not the safest thing. I mean, it's not that a not that a tuba player cannot play that, but it's just like like you know, do you really want that wee kind of like you know, it, it, it's it's not the most pleasant sound, and it uh, certainly is not the kind of thing that really accompanies this. But sometimes, like things that are possible on the instruments are not really all as pleasant and are not as convenient as you might think. Right, so here I would just like I'd let the bass trombone take over the upper part here, and same thing here. I mean, here you're setting up two D's in a row, right? Rather than the kind of inevitable whoa kind of idea. Yeah, and then you've already got this happening here too. So you just you know just let the tuba player stop on this D and cut the rest of it. Maybe just add a little, you know, add the two D's on either side of this high D here in your in your tuba. Right. Da -da -da -da. Yeah. Okay. So we've got our leaping octaves here, and then you go to a solid just blasting away, and you're giving your you're writing in breaths for your tuba player. You know, you might not need to do that. You just you could just write footballs there and like the player will take a breath anyway. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> one thing that's really interesting about this whole passage here, you know, going all the way through to here, is that you are varying the um, the functions of certain elements, right? So like, so for instance, like, you know, chunk, 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 and so on, and then going over to the heavy brass, you know, between the heavy, like the trombones and the and the horns and so on and so forth. It's got a nice variation of color, okay? And then you have this, like, push right in here. Um, and you just like a little bit of bassoon here, and then the bassoon comes back, and then this bassoon stays... In play, uh, you know, you solved a few things. You know, like kept certain uh, certain things going rather than putting in a bunch of gaps and rests and things. I, I don't I don't understand why the melody is nice and high here, and then here it kind of goes to this. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So we'll just we'll just take a we'll just pick things apart a little bit. All right. So <clears throat> starting here, we've got our um, kind of double octave. So just as long as you're really aware, like 
um, like it's not really a double it's double octave. It is an octave, right? So you've got your it's doubled parts, I should say. So you've got your two C trumpets here, um, doubling on the melody here, and I, I see that you have got, decided to go with enharmonic pitches in flats rather than in sharps and double sharps. Um, so this is going to be very, very intense on top with kind of no moderation, and the same thing here. Right, so it's going to be kind of a, a stunning, almost chilling kind of a sound. And you've got all of this breadth right in here, Let's, you know, this kind of warm stuff happening that like is not getting in the way of the melody. But what I'd submit that you do not have enough of is impact instruments. Um, and by the way, I really love the way that the, the timpani are working the, um, the melody right in here with the leaping octaves and stuff. But I think that like if you are gonna come in here with this just just devastating uh, treatment of the melody to start off with, um, you know I think that a you know it, it's not enough to have like a bass drum roll to a mezzo forte kind of a thing with this much fortissimo going on. I think you need a fortissimo stroke in in timpani, you know, and possibly even like a crash on your cymbal or something like that. You know, da 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 ch da bloom. You know what I mean? Da da. And then here, like you're going to um, uh, octaves in your trumpets and piccolo up above, and you know it's it's a very squeaky sound. It's good that you're doubling it with the um, with these flutes, but you know you know my my entire estimation here is that there's something a little tinny, a little um, a little trebly and, and not as having as much emphasis as it could have in all four of these bars, like this one, these three, and the next one, and the next page. Um, yeah, just because of, you know, I, I'm just like, I must feel like there needs to be more, like, it, it sort of looks almost as if you sort of gave up on scoring your strings here, like you were going to do something and then you sort of changed your mind and you never got around to writing it in. Is sort of what it looks like here. I mean, I would. I mean, yeah, you have tons of weight here on the trumpets, and in, in and in a way, they're going to blast out everything that you've got there. But what if you had octave? What if you had octave um, second violins here, like playing this note and the note below it, and you had violas pl doubling with the lower divisi second violins? then you would have beautiful weight on there. It would be have a wonderfully moderating sound on the trumpets here and so on. And then here, ba bum ba bum. Is there are there more winds that you could bring in here? If you're gonna have the strings going yet yeah, da, 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 da. I love this this little syncopation in here. Yeah, that's that's really wonderful. Um And then here, you like you just bring in your whole string section to go. And then you add an octave here. That's really cool. So you know what I think? I just think you know you just need a little bit more weight on your melody somehow. Somebody like you've got all of these people, you know, blasting around in here, jumping and leaping and staccatoing and tenutoing. Somebody has got to be available to double something. And so like, you know, basically like the thing is like pick somebody who is already being, whose part is already being played by the trombones because they don't need any help, right? Like for instance here, second bassoon does not need any help, right? It's places like that. Um, and, you, you know, and just in general, like maybe there is a way of, of progressing the texture even more than just trading off between uh, trombones and horns and trombones and horns and so on. Uh, maybe there's a way that the that the parts can react and build and uh, and crest and show emphasis, right? Maybe instead of just a, like a big roll here in the timpani, you can have like a roll to a boom, roll to a boom, roll to a boom over and over again, louder and louder each time. You know, there's just, I think there's like, the, the main thing you want to avoid in a section like this is 
set it and forget it, right? Like once we figured out what is a good strategy that works in the first two or three bars, just kind of leaving those players to stay in that position for the rest of the of the passage, right? Even if though it's only 11 bars long, you think, well, it's 11 bars long, Thomas, what do you want from me? Uh, I would say, I want you to, I want you to progress your texture like Mahler, is what I would say, right? Now, um, uh, one last thing that I would say in here is, do we want the melody to stay really, really high up to this high B in the piccolo and, and high B in the, in the sopranos, uh, doubled by flutes? and second violins like um in the piano part it intentionally brings things down you know da, 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 da. um so like it you know the even though the 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 piano part has been descending and descending and descending there really is a an added emphasis of like everything really being focused around the middle of the piano there and that really sets up what's happening here right the the lower stuff so do we want this to scream really really high so you know a lot of times like i ask people questions like you know do you want this do you want that i'm not saying that that you know that i think you shouldn't therefore you shouldn't right um i'm just just like possibly challenging the uh presumption right which you don't have to you don't have to come back and me say of course i do because a b c d e f and g you don't have to list everything it's just like saying like have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? You don't have to answer me. You can just just work it out and see like how like maybe this is something Thomas thinks I should should weigh and you know and maybe like in answering that for myself I can come up with something that is even better than what Thomas might have been suggesting or implying and that I thought of in the first place, right? That's the hope is that, you know, that you are going to come up with something better than I could suggest. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, there, there is a lot of, of, um, there is some, not a lot, but there is some, uh, function shifting from place to place. But I think that you could do more and you could be coming back here with something that just absolutely scorches by the end. Right. So so that would be I think that's all I can really say ab about this, because I think that like for the most part, you have put things into registers where they will work great. Um, and just like you just need a little bit more weight across um, just to really making sure that you really are doubling all of the different um, places along these octaves. Um we are sort of missing a voice though here and that is between the violas and the cellos um i wouldn't leave that gap right and you might be thinking well you know that's why i've got you know i got trumpets right in here and so on but then you know later on we don't we the trumpet jumps up the second trumpet jumps up and then we don't have that voice down there anymore right so um, it won't hurt anything for the violas to go to um, Divisi octaves here and fill in, fill that in, and then for you to free up somebody who's just repeating somebody else's part and just throw them in too. All right, but you know, other than that, really cool D section, just you know, some phenomenal stuff that you've got going on in there. Now, before I go launching into this uh, full-scale analysis of the first half of this piece, of this orchestration, I just want to mention how beautifully smooth the transitions between textures are. Just gorgeous. You know, like, like how easily the strings lead to the vibes and the harp and the and the and the vocals and how the horns come in here and then that leads to a transition to the strings and the and then the then the winds so carefully like 
slot themselves in and then the harp comes back and then then the winds and the strings and the choir all work together and you know I just really really wonderful examples of what I'm talking about in the in the evaluation criteria you know does the treatment of the melody represent an emotional and timbral progression boy howdy how they do you know um does does the treatment and uh, I, I just think it's just really, really lovely. You know, I'll probably have a lot of suggestions and things to say and, and, and you know, and possible things to fix. But just, you know, just to notice that from, from the very beginning, I think is extremely important in looking at this. Okay, so um, from the very first note of the mock-up here, you know, we're once again, we're reminded of the fact that your sound set is so undeserving of you, FJ. <laughs> like, your sound set does not deserve to be in your setup. You know, it is it is completely unworthy of you. Like the the way that it's interpreting the uh, the tremolo to be like separate MIDI events. You know, it's like <laughs> it just really kind of sounds nervous and freakish. Whereas, like the the actual effect of what you want to want played here is would just be so delicate. You know, and wispy. And with the sopranos coming in, with the ums, the sopranos, altos, and tenors coming in with the ums, an octave lower, just gorgeous. And then this little roll on the vibraphone, which just, you know, like like your vibraphone stuff in here, which, you know, is, is so beautiful. Like here, it, you know, here it sounds like, um, you, you know, like those, like, like, uh, kind of, um, like, sort of cheesy, um, uh, Caribbean, like pseudo Caribbean commercial music, right in here, you know, with like the, like a, um, like the, the kind of cheesy marimba kind of stuff, right in here, and it's just like that's not what your music should sound like, even in a mock-up that is, you know, that is recognized to not be professional, to not be, um, really representing what the orchestra would sound like, right? I, th I think you can do way better. You know, how, whatever, I don't know what setup you've got. If you're working in Dorico, try to get note performer at the very least, okay? Or if, I think, if this is finale, then, um, then, uh, then I think a uh, note performer also works in finale as well. So anyways, but it's just really beautiful. And then the use of two harps in here, gorgeous. It is exactly a, a, just a really lovely way to score two harps. You know, so far I have not seen anything in the harp scoring that <clears throat> is impossible or impractical or uncomfortable or annoying. I think that it, I think it all would work. I think the standard, you know, most harpists would probably look at it and say, well, there's one or two little things here or there, but like the kind of scoring, you know, like especially crossover scoring like this, right? It's like, like the, by adding the choir, it becomes kind of like a crossover score, right? So it's just absolutely perfect. Harps doing more than what a keyboard could do. That is really what you want when you're working with two harps in this kind of beautiful gushing, arpeggiated, rolled chord kind of scoring. All right, and then especially with the vibraphone as their as like the third part, turning them into a trio. It's just such so lovely, and then the horns coming in here, pianissimo. You exactly got it right. I would actually go crescendo here to piano. By the time you get to this accented note and the horn start, so pianissimo, crescendo to piano, crescendo to mezzo piano. By the time you get to to here, right? And I think you have the perfect balance. And then yeah, and this lovely stuff in here, with your um, with your choir and the strings and the little pizzicato and the basses, just beautiful. And then. Here, your um, your winds are insinuating themselves, uh, really nice. I don't see any problems here, and I love the way that you're keeping the horns in the background a little bit, right? And yeah, it's it gets a bit surgy, you know, just kind of like the um, kind of predictably, but like since you are varying the texture, it's not so bad, you know, with the with your harps in here and, and vibraphone coming back and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Da, da, da. Yeah, and then, yeah, and the way that this, this part right in here, which <clears throat> in many scores is like really integrated into a very few instruments, the way that you stretch it out across different functions and different areas and different, uh, different registers of instruments. Beautiful. 
And then right in here, da da ba da ba 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 It's pretty full-blooded, but I love the way that you end in a in triple P and pianissimo and so on and so forth. Just really giving everybody a chance. Like if you're gonna hold this far into, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if you're gonna go this far into this bar, I, I think you have to be careful who gets marked what as a as a fermata and so on. Maybe you could just cut the fermata here over the triple P mark and then instead have like a, just put in a comma, like a sort of a, an apostrophe, like like just, you know, so that the conductor places the next downbeat, right? And it's almost as if the orchestra takes a breath. Da, 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 right? Okay, so I love what's going on here, and we're going to break things apart a little bit. But I'm just wondering, you know, can you spare a cello here? I would rather that you had, your like, the lower line here, the second voice of your basses. I would rather have that interacting with Divisi cellos, like the lower Divisi cellos. Or is there a poss possibility that this part here in violas and cellos it could be played just by violas, divisi, and this part here could be played by cellos. Because, I mean, you're going a pretty darn high here with your with your basses, right? And, and it's not so much that basses cannot play that and that they can't play that smoothly. They can. But the, the reality is that that, chen, that, sorry, that tenor register of the basses is easily swallowed by everything else that's going on. And I think that when you have doubling that that takes advantage of some of these pitches and some of the other instruments, like especially trombone, you need a partner in the strings that is going to be more powerful, more engaged, more um, uh, more of an equal partner. It, you know, if it's possible to be for the strings to be equal to the trombones in in any grouping. So yeah, so I just really feel that that cellos are are indicated in the upper voice here. So if there's any way to reorganize the strings that you've got here so that the uh, so that so that some or all of the cellos are taking the upper part here, it would really really help your score right in here. But, you know, other other than that, you've got uh, you've got some octave scoring here. Uh, sorry, I had to sort of clear my eyes for a second because yeah, just the notes are so small even on my big screen here my big desktop screen. Yeah, if there's any way at all that you can make your staff size just a little bit bigger, and I know it's difficult with two harps and more percussion and, uh, you know, nice spread out uh, uh, vocal staves, but, you know, if, if you can, like, decrease the space a little bit between the staves and just, you know, just somehow get it up a couple of points then that would be great. I, I noticed that you've already like almost eliminated any kind of margin <laughs> in on any side of this score and that's that's exactly fine because like I I don't mind taking up the entire screen and not having much of a margin because I'm pointing to things with my mouse pointer with a little call out ring around it. So um, so that's not a it's not an issue of where the attention goes and whether or not you can follow along. Alright, so yeah, so all right, but to get back to, let's just stay on that function for a while. A uh, little bit of timpani, bum bum. I just love that the way that that comes in and the way that the winds flow out of it and the first bar here. Um, and I sort of miss that same flow, like in the winds. Here you, you turn it over to the brass and then you integrate that into the place where the middle voice starts coming in going yada da dum. And that's great. I just I wish the winds had had hung around for another bar, or if they had somehow flowed and integrated into the brass in a sort of a really nice gradual handoff, um, right? Uh, I think that that would have that might have been even smoother. But I mean, it's it's uh, this is like a picky, subtle little thing that you know possibly only me as another orchestrator would have noticed. 
Okay, and then, yeah, and this is really lovely. The bassoons and the trombones and the basses down here, like, and this is really, really where you need your cellos, right in here, to keep things even. And, you know, you can get to the point in your cellos where you can, where the basses can be playing the lower uh, bassoon part and the cellos can be playing the upper bassoon part because it's just really easy for them, right? So you just have get, you get more voices that way with... Uh, you know, with more equal, with a more equal partner in your cellos. All right, and now, treatment of the melody. Um, octaves here, you're adding a little bit of harmony into the octaves. The sixth, very, very simple to play. And it's the kind of thing that, you know, you could, you could completely go non divisi here with no problem. You know, just sixths are just the easiest thing to play. Um, you know, it just fits right under the fingers. Uh, for a string player. I'd say in all of these parts. These could all be non divisi if you wanted them to. They don't have to be. They could be divisi and they still sound fine. And then, um, yeah, and then flutes. You're keeping your flutes high. You're, you know, you're not doing too much low scoring here. And oboes, playing along with them. It's just a gorgeous way of having them bulk up the strings here. And at the same time, uh, bringing in these voices here, uh, first horn and uh, and trumpet, right? They it looks like the um, you know almost looks like they're they're near the same pitches, but they're not. The um, the horn is supplying the B at the bottom of the little thirds, that harmony part. Same, pretty pretty much just the same line here as the cellos. Yeah, I mean. It's just lovely. I mean, it's very judicious. You're, you're not filling up the whole sound picture all the time. You're just taking particular points of the melody and the harmony, and you are working them in um, in ways that like don't clutter things up too much. And that's great. Yeah, and then just this this little fade right here. Yeah. Right. Da, 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 da. Yeah, just really, really nice here. Now, like, this is very similar to the last score I looked at. Um, yeah, so just suddenly pushing at that, you know, it's sort of like, you just really have to be careful not to, like, stick an ice pick in your listener's ear all of a sudden, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Zero need for you to do this. Everybody, any, any string player worth their salt is going to want to play up bow here. You don't need to tell them that that's what's going to happen. Right. So they'll probably, you know, this player here will go down, up, down. This player here will probably go down, uh, up, down, up, up, down. Yeah. I mean, just really beautiful right in here. I think that this all fits together really nicely. I don't even think you need the piccolo up there. But, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a nice little light, nice little sweetening at the top, just as long as it sort of stays in the background, I would say. Like, what if it came in at pianissimo and went up to mezzo piano and back down to pianissimo? Okay. And here we get to that really lovely part, uh, B, you know, where everything it goes to A minor, you know, ba, da, da, and this is just gorgeous, like this, you know, right in here, like there, there does not need to be any any basis right in here, right, because you have got uh, just this this lovely, you know, like starting loud and then dying off, starting mezzo forte and dying off, and it's like each time you come back a little less strength. It's really really lovely, and I think it works great. Um, and then you're know, right in here, your horns, uh, starting off mezzo forte, dying off to pianissimo, and then the same thing here, piano down to triple P. It's just really, really nice, sensitively scored. You are absolutely, you know, really looking out for the strings here. And, and yeah, just, I would even say like, um, like fortissimo molto espressivo here. I just really like, you know, just having, you know, really yawking it up if you know what I mean. And then, like, here you bring in your basses a little bit more, and so on. 
And this is the place where, like, once again, I just would really be tempted to see, you know, if there's any way to free up some cellos to to continue to help out here, right? And then once they're all done here, they could go back to, you know, their other jobs, their other tasks. All right, and now here we're getting to that wonderful kind of wandering line. Okay, and I really love the whole, um, you know, the, like ahs and ums in here. I think this would just turn out fantastically well. Um, I, I know there are some um, there are some sound sets that actually have different vowel sounds, and some people have actually used them to sort of put together actual words, <laughs> right, in in their mock-ups. Uh, but very sophisticated. It'd be more like, you know, using a DAW rather than using a notation um, yeah, using notation. We haven't quite got to the point where you can write syllables in your notation software and the, uh, the, your sound set analyzes what syllable you've written under it and then, and then supplies that sound. Someday though, we just need to get our processing speed up. Yeah, and this is gorgeous. The roll and the arpeggiated uh, little exploratory thing. And this is kind of cool, the way you, like, you come in here with the oboe right at the crest, right? Just as, you know, there's this push right in here from your singers. And I feel that that push helps to supply a bit of harmonic context in here so that when the oboe comes in, it's not such a such a surprise. But in a live situation, it might be, right? We're, we're sort of hearing that on the mock-up, just like we have the pressure of the overtones here, and then the oboe comes in, and it, it just feels like it's just as natural as anything. The vibraphone helps in that regard, too. Um, you, know, <laughs> you know, you might want to have your oboe start half a bar early at triple P and then just like, and then sing into it, right? That might be a way of solving that problem. And then here, like, um, we have kind of a similar thing happening. So my only question to you here would be, what if the treatment of these two different, like these sort of sister phrases here, was completely different? Is there anything that you could do to bring complete and total freshness into this? Because then, like, continuing on with the next two bars, while the scoring is different, you have got you've got more wins and so on. You still have, you know, still have these. You still have a little bit of harp at the beginning, and you still have the vibes playing this, and you still have the the uh, voices. And you still have the strings up there. Is there anything that you can do to bring just complete and total freshness into each one, so that there maybe there's a different combination of instruments or a different instrument playing this line in here? I would totally not do this, by the way. This is a second. Um, this is a second player's part. This is a first player's part, especially if you're going to end up, you know, you know, and this right in here, like just really just swap this for that, right? Because look, the player's hand is already going to be up there. Don't make them drop down here when that really is something that the second harpist could be doing a lot better, especially with the responsibility that the first harpist has got. Don't do this. This is just, you know, a little too accommodating to the second when the second is not does not need it, isn't expecting it. Better to leave the first player up there and the second player down there. Yeah. So um, I didn't have a big problem with the way this this was scored, except for one little detail. And that is this low D. What do we need this low D here for? Think of the context of this piece. You know just how beautiful and free it is and how it describes the countryside and the point of view and and you know wandering right so the line wanders through this bar without any accompaniment whatsoever in the piano part why does it need any in the orchestra part you know i'd say if there's if there is going to be a single note that you hold it should be the e right because that is part of the melody at the beginning of the bar but even that Right, but I just feel that this low D just really kind of drags down the energy at a point where this should be wandering freely in space with the, with the uh, audience having absolutely zero idea where it's going to end up. Right. 
So maybe this needs a little bit of a rethink right in here, um, if you agree with me about that. Okay, so last little bit that we'll be evaluating here. You know, da, 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 da. This is really lovely in here. Um, first flute, first oboe. Yeah, um, first clarinet. I uh, just really, really gorgeous. Like you're just really using a, a nice, like, but all the same. Even though it's really spread out in the winds, it's very simple. And then you've got just a little bit of first violin doubling at the top to sort of sweeten this. Um, I would say, don't do this. Like with your, with your violins being at the same level as the winds and the flute being softer. I would say just have the flute be the same level as the rest of the winds and have your strings be stronger, be up to mezzo piano. And then I think you get a really, really nice uh, blend of winds and strings on the top, um, giving context to all of the texture below. And this is really cool right in here, like the, the, um, the timpani uh, assisting the leaping octaves. But I think that like some of this stuff right in here gets a little distracting to the ear of the listener, right? I mean, I, I understand what you do. You're, you're sort of trying to like um, for do a little foreshadowing to the role here, right? But it all it ends up doing is just really be kind of like, you know, what the hell's the timpani doing sort of a sound? I think it'd be better for you just to, you know, just to help out, you know, and then right here, you could even go, you know, bum, 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 tup, tup, tup on the, on the uh, timpani and then go into a, just a soft roll. Or you, can, you could even just start the roll here. This is just a straight roll. Not, not, none of this other stuff is necessary. Yeah. Um, so I would say just like really, really important for in this C section um, for, the, uh, for the leaping octaves to stay really subtle all the way through, but to not get lost. So here you're bringing them out, and you're you're starting a push here, and this is all nicely scored. You have piccolo coming in on the top, right? And then here you go to this big crest right in here, and you're keeping, you're keep you're holding back your uh, lower heavy brass right in here, and that's good. That's a good thing because you want it to be more of a string-like kind of a texture. So I would just say like be careful about longer lasting pitches in the in the mid range like this fourth horn right in here or these bassoons right in here like because they are going to be the thing that confuses the picture the most in terms of the sense of motion of the bottom end because you you've already got so much um you know you've already got so much weight on top you've got um you know you've got that wonderful just gorgeous harmony happening here and I think it's great to bring in the second violins here and have this octave in there I think that that is absolutely great but I think as far as like the these low notes middle notes and the bass clarinet and bassoons and the um and the trombone not the well trombone is okay the first trombone is, is fine but yeah but like the sorry I was my eye focused on this but I really I was really meant to say the fourth horn so just, you know, think about that, experiment, what can you take out that will help make the leaping octaves a little clearer? Because like the way that, the way that you have them lead into the cascading octaves is just so gorgeous. And I would hate for the, you know, there to be this kind of swelling moment here that just sounds glorious, but we kind of lose the pulse, right? Anyway, um, <laughs> with that, I, I do have to stop. Um, I think I'm, I'm using up enough time on this and, and, you know, obviously you're making so many correct decisions on this. It's not like I have to, um, you know, go over every single decision and every single, you know, every single phrase and every single bar to really make sure that you got everything right. You, you, just a lot of this is working on its own. And I'm sure that like other, other really obvious things will occur to you and you'll fix them and, and amend them and so on and so forth. But yeah, just, you know, as, as I'm getting to the end of these, um, of these lectures, just seeing more and more with the full length, with these full length versions, there are, are, you know, 
There are some that are really close to being ready to the stand, ready for the stands, and and should be performed. You know. Uh, yeah, and this is one of them, especially if you can find some lyrics to add to these vocal parts. So with that, I will stop <laughs> and just say thank you so much, FJ. I mean, I think you're your scoring here has a real empathy with the source music and, uh, you know, a real sympathy uh, with the culture of music from which it comes. And, and you know, I, I just really am so happy that you put all the work into this and the imagination and thinking up the choir part and, and all that other stuff. Uh, it just really brought a new element into our conversation here. Um, with these orchestration challenges. And I just really appreciate that. It's one of the most original scores. Well, I mean, how can things, something be more original than something else? It's either original or it's not. But this is one of the scores that had some of the most different and unique elements in it. So, um, so I just really am happy about that and really glad that this score was something that that fit into what we're doing and, you know, and that you helped support the channel as well, along with all our other Patreon supporters and, um, and website subscribers and viewers and so on. Um, all of you guys are doing great and please continue, uh, give FJ some comments below. Um, and I'm sure that you already have a lot of you already have. So it's just like, that's so important. And it's hugely appreciated by me. Always makes me really happy. And especially a score like this deserves, uh, you know, as many comments as it can get. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm not sure that you could make an oratorio out of the next piece that we're going to do. But I'm sure would love to hear your thoughts on your thoughts in orchestration form on our next challenge, which will be dropping in about six months or so. So watch for that, everybody, and there will be yet another cool score to look at in just a couple of hours. Hang on for that, and I'll see you guys then.